Hey, everybody, welcome back to another riveting episode of RPM Red Peace Machine. And today we are missing Ramesh, which is a real drag because he usually runs it. And now I have to. And he's super smart and he's always on time. <laughs> so are you. You're er you're very smart and you're even early. <laughs> I am really. Um, so uh, I just let's run around real quick and check in on everybody. Uh, doctors, how are you? I'll go first. I also want to say we're, we are missing Roy Peace, who is working on Susanna Woody's uh, campaign, running for commissioner. Uh, Y'all know what to do. <laughs> um, yeah, other than that, doing damn good. Um, we got a big gift for uh, I am the organization and have hired some new folks. Um, really, really happy That's about cool. that. Yeah. Going to have some announcements coming up soon, maybe. Yes. Um, we're basically up in our game. We're getting on social media in a real way. Um, coming up pretty soon. Um, yes. Uh, happy, happy. <laughs> happy, happy. Joy, joy. And now it's time for Mr. Roy. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, I've been really enjoying the cool June and July. Now we're starting August uh, weather. Uh, I've been really enjoying the extra rain that we never usually get at this time of the year. And yeah. so uh, I have changed my position on global warming and I am now a, a, a fan. <laughs> oh I don't even it. think we've hit 100 yet. Uh, no, we haven't. We hit 99. We hit 99. I think we we have, it, which is, you know, insane. The same um, but, thing happened last summer. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the summers are getting cooler, but the falls are getting hotter. We, we, we have been experiencing pretty hot yeah. Septembers and Octobers, which are yeah. jarring, but you know, yeah. uh, it's better than living in Oregon. That place is hell. Uh, right <laughs> they're melting on another note, we yesterday the boys basically roy and our two boys noticed right outside our door there's this huge pot right uh, with different flowers in it and and roy kind of said oh look at this hole and then cena our older one went in and what happened he found a bird laying there trying to be real wow. still and uh, we, we try to identify the bird. And I have a friend who works for uh, Texas Parks and Recreation. And so I always send him my wildlife pictures. Right. And, and he's like, I, I'm stumped. I don't know. And, and I came up with Common Night Hawk and he went, that's it. So there's, so uh, we've been looking at pictures of Common Night Hawks. So there's a baby Common Night Hawk. So right where's the mama? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure it's flying in and out, and it was probably away because we were there. But he wasn't abandoned or anything. No, I think. don't think so. Oh, it that is healthy. so cool. I know. I saw his little feathers. I have uh, barn swallows that that build their mud nests and shit all over my porch every spring. But I love swallows. I don't even. Oh, my God. All they do is have fun. Yeah. I just want to come back and be a swallow. They have so much fun. And the babies are so crazy cute. And they, when they look over, yeah, the they look over, and then all of a sudden they all go, their necks pop up and ah, for the food. <laughs> yeah, those are the only kind of children I'm I'm okay with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Love our kids. I'm serious. I know I will. There are certain people who have kids that are worth it, and then other people I'm just like, stay over there, six feet, six <laughs> feet. <laughs> Isn't that just true for all humans? <laughs> So today we're going to talk about Afghanistan, and um, I have some questions uh, just to start. And my first question is, what the hell are we doing there in the first place? I mean, they didn't have anything to do with 9-11 as far as I know. Is that correct? So, so the answer is, it's a little bit complicated. It's not actually that complicated, but, it, but, but there's levels to this. Um, so, the, you know, the U.S. used... Uh, the, the Mujahideen, which had or, organizations within it, Taliban was one of them. Okay, and can you tell us what what that means? So, is that the yeah. government? What is the Mujahideen? The uh, Mujahideen no, was the Mujahideen, rebel Mujahideen. forces during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Okay, um, they 
<clears throat> so when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, so the, here's the pattern. When you invade Afghanistan, <laughs> the, the Afghans do a bunch of nothing. They just sort of let oh. you, they let you in. And they let you get okay. comfortable and put your feet up on the chair. And then <laughs> little by little, they start to fight you. And, and eventually it, it just becomes, it's an exponential curve. At some point, you will no longer be able to stay there. It's not possible. It's not doable. And wow. they've been doing this for about 200 years now. So this is, this is their formula. They've been invaded uh, five times in 200 years, and they've done that every single time. They just let you in. You get comfortable. They start to go at you. And eventually, at some point, the violence level reaches a breaking point, and you'll have to leave. Wow. Um, well, who, inv who invaded them besides us? And have we done it multiple times or is it just a one off? So the, we've only invaded Afghanistan once. The British invaded Afghanistan three times. Um, <laughs> the last time was at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so if you look at a, a map of Brit the British Empire at the point where there's World War I, they actually had Afghanistan at that moment. Um, wow. And then when you look at a British Empire map of World War II, there's no Afghanistan in the British right. Empire because they lost it. Um, so the British invaded three times, the Soviets invaded, and then we invaded. And during the Soviet invasion, it was actually a Texas politician who championed supporting the Afghan rebels against the Soviet Union. And um, we, we did it. We funded them. We trained them. We set up CIA camps in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, and uh, we we armed them and equipped them. And one and two of the organizations we worked very closely with was Al Qaeda and the Taliban. And um, so they were on our side. They were they were not only on our side. You got to remember that the Bin Laden family is actually totally linked to our oil families. Bush, uh, right? Especially, yeah, like the Bush family, for example. So, um, you know, I think the 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 running understanding was that we, here we are. We're, Osama bin Laden created an organization of Muslims that he wanted to go to Afghanistan to volunteer to fight the Soviets, and he brought Muslims from all over the world, and they they succeeded. Right, the Soviet Union is driven out now. They succeeded for multiple reasons. One, there was no way the Soviets could ever conquer Afghanistan. That was, they just didn't read enough history before they invaded. But, you know, it didn't help any that Chernobyl happened. No. <laughs> and, God, uh, no. I mean, Chernobyl was an absolute catastrophe for the Soviet Union. We're, it, it happened 35 years ago. And I think we're only now kind of figuring out the full extent of the catastrophe. Um, the Soviet movie was good. <laughs> The, yeah, so this, I, I've actually started watching the, the show. I'm, I'm, I think I'm on episode four now. It's um, pretty good. It's really amazing. But the Soviets had to mobilize 500,000 people. The show says 750, and maybe that was their target. But, but my understanding is they actually mobilized 500,000. Uh, imagine trying to come up with a half million people while you're in the middle of a war. And, and, and just the economic cost of that, because all of those people had their life expectancy shortened and they weren't in the factory working, they weren't in the farm fields producing food, and then throw on the actual cost. And in today dollars, it was about $68 billion. And you know, in 1986, the Soviet Union did not have $68 billion no. to spend. And that's probably also why the Soviet Union, the, this is probably the straw that broke the camel's back, the war in Afghanistan and the, the Chernobyl, accident it's it certainly completely changed the soviet union because right in the aftermath of that gorbachev's is suddenly doing glasnost and perestroika and, right and the soviet union is liberalizing and then it collapses five years later um so <clears throat> we abandon the guys that we had helped defeat the soviet union the we we the the mujahideen in its in its naivete assumed that when they defeated the Soviet Union, we would come in with aid. They, so where they are we? we, were going, we, we they thought we were going to do to them what we did to Europe after World War II with a Marshall Plan. Okay. So okay. what and what what period of time is this? How far advanced are we? So it, uh, the Soviets withdrew, I think, in 89. Does that sound right? I know it was right before the collapse. Uh and the Soviet Union That's, collapsed in 91. So right. 89 is a year in my head. Double check it, it's probably wrong. Um, and uh, when the when the Soviet Union withdrew, the Taliban was under the impression we were going to come in and help them repair, right? Because the Soviets were nasty. They weren't 
they, they did they did to Vietnam what we did. I'm sorry, they did to Afghanistan what we did to Vietnam, right? They they went in there, they massacred villages, they poisoned the poison the countryside. You know, we dumped Agent Orange all over the place. They 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 kind of if you were a leftist and you thought, well, at least the Soviet Union isn't as evil as the United States, you you your heart had to have been broken after the Afghan war. <laughs> <There> was, <laughs> it became immediately clear that the, the Soviets were capable of just sadistic cruelty. Um, and, and, and a lot of the infrastructure was destroyed. So Afghanistan was reduced to rubble and the Afghans thought we were gonna come in there and at least give them loans, but you know, foreign aid would have been great too and help them rebuild, get them a new hospital, get them a new road, get them a new school, get them a new police station. And we gave yeah. them nothing. We didn't give them a dime. So they felt used. And then Afghanistan turned into a civil war and it was a nightmarish hell. And that, that only exacerbated things. And then the Taliban, they never fully won the civil war by the time we invaded uh, in 2001, but they controlled 80% of Afghanistan. So at that point, it, they were trying to wind it down. The great irony of course, is it was Iran that was preventing them from, from completing their project. Iran was uh, supplying and funding the Northern Alliance, which had mazar e Sharif, which is the fourth largest city in Afghanistan. And, and, as, and they were just holding on to this little enclave of about 25% when the United States attacked. Um, wow. Okay, so, all right, let's, let's back up just for a second. So uh, we attack for what reason? So. Osama bin Laden definitely turned on the United States. Um, and one of the reasons why he did was because he was angry about the fact that we weren't helping Afghanistan. But the thing that really threw him over the edge was what we do to Iraq. Um, he, he could not get it out of his mind first that we had set soldiers in Saudi Arabia because he saw Saudi Arabia as, as sacred. And here were all these non-Muslims entering Saudi Arabia to defend it. So what year are we talking about? So the United States goes into Saudi Arabia in 1990. And then in 91, we do a completely sadistic war on Iraq. It's a 30 day long air war and a five day land war. And in the For 30 day long air war on Iraq, we blow up every hospital, we blow up every police station, every school, every bridge. We just go after all these civilian targets. And- um, But was that shock and awe? No, that well, wasn't this, called shock and awe. It was something similar though. I remember it had yeah, it was a name. A, it was a 30 day war. I mean, yeah. the irony, air war, the irony of shock and awe was it only lasted a couple of days. Yeah. Like we were already doing the land war, right? We, so, you know, what the definition of terror is shock and awe. So we yeah. actually named the opening sequence to the 2003 invasion of Iraq terrorism, right? <laughs> we called it the shock. war against terrorism by, by ter terrorism. And and the fact that nobody noticed how ironic that was, they did notice the original name because the original name was Operation Iraqi Liberation, yeah. and that, that spelled out oil. And they went, ah, oh, shit. So they had to go back and they had to change the <laughs> orders to say. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah. I didn't oh either. And so the original orders went out with oil written all over it. And then somebody went, that, that's bad. And so they switched that is, to freedom. You know that was intentional. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that. That is so fuck. That is so us. That is so us. Jeez. And it was purposeful. Oh, for you sure. And so, but then they had to rename it OIF. And so that oh, became that's... the, the over. Okay. Thing. So, so, okay. So, okay. so, so your question is, why do we go after? Uh, yeah. So Osama bin Laden was operating the Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan, and then he attacked the World Trade Center in the '90s during the Clinton administration. Remember, he drove the the bombs yeah. into the garage and and you know did the damage, but he obviously left the World Trade Center intact. And then a few years later, he flies the airplanes in. So. Yeah. So even though not a single one of the 19 hijackers was Afghani, the organization we wanted to get at was in Afghanistan. It wasn't an Afghani organization. And it was an ally of the Taliban. They fought alongside the Taliban during the Afghan civil war. So we then immediately decide we're gonna go into Afghanistan. Um, the Afghan government, actually the Taliban government says, we'll help you round up Al Qaeda. We're ready, we, you know, 
uh, they were our friend and our ally, but this is this is this crossed the line for us. We didn't want right. 9-11 to happen. And uh, we, we, of course, say no. And there's lots of reasons for this. So what we covered last time we covered these. Uh, yeah. Did we cover the opium end of it? No, no, we didn't. No. So one of the things that drove the United States absolutely bonkers, which is the reason the British invaded three times, was opium. And yeah. to be clear, the Taliban had ended opium production in the 80% of Afghanistan that they controlled. And that was something the United States hated. So we needed to take the Taliban out to get the opium back into circulation. And no, we and didn't we... want it for morphine. We wanted it for heroin. Okay, and and the way ways I can prove this to you so that you don't think I'm talking out of my ass and just making something up is the U.S. has, it is confirmed, in fact, I believe BBC, for, uh, for sure, The Guardian, um, you can find an article on the United States actually used U.S. taxpayer dollars to fund opium production in Afghanistan after the invasion. It is the entire reason why the British invaded Afghanistan three times, because right, the British empire is the world's first ever narcotic dealing empire. It, it funded itself first with tobacco and then later replaced it with, with opium. And Afghanistan, of course, is the world's opium capital. Yeah. And then, of course, the primary use that the British had in the 19th century for opium was to intentionally hook the Chinese po population on it so that they could then force China into a trade arrangement because the Chinese want, didn't want to trade with the British. The British didn't have anything they wanted to buy. Ironically that is some enough, because early, back there again, right? <laughs> that's some early chemical warfare and long strategy there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really well, the working British, that out. The, the British were great at first. They were also the first people to intentionally use germ warfare. Um, they, were, they, they, they really helped pioneer the co concept of concentration camps. I mean, they, they really have gotten a lot of amazing, and I, and I don't wanna say British, I wanna say English so that we're accurate, right? right? I mean, the Scots and the Welsh obviously assisted, but they were sort of dragged along kicking and screaming, so. Right, right. and the Welsh, the poor, the, can, can I get a vowel? I mean, Welsh <laughs> is just a string of consonants. <laughs> Look, W is a vowel in Welsh. So, so you just oh, like a, a vowel, yeah. Trigger it, <laughs> Love that town. <laughs> okay, so uh, now, so we've been fighting. How long have we been in Afghanistan? We'll be 20 years. Uh, is it October? I want to say we invaded in October. Uh, so it'll be 20 years. Anyway, it's at the end of this year, it'll be 20 years. And Trump is the one who announced that we're getting out. So o Obama actually tried to get us out in Afghanistan. Um, his, he, one of his campaign promises was he was gonna end both the US war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he definitely brought our troop numbers down. Mm -hmm. um, Trump actually ramped our troop numbers up in Afghanistan. But then in the end, uh, he, he, so the Doha conference, the Doha agreement, which was last year, 2020, um, was uh, started actually by Obama. What, the United States began secretly negotiating with the Taliban in Qatar. What is Doha? Doha is the capital of Qatar, which is okay. the tiny little peninsula that sticks off of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Um, it's an oil-rich emirate that... Uh, oh. uh, it's got a population of like 200,000 people, but it has global influence because it has so much money. Um, so, uh, you know, Doha is a tiny village. It's it's its capital, but it's a wow. It's a neighborhood in Austin. So um, <laughs> the, the Obama administration began secretly negotiating with the Taliban, and what Trump did was he stopped it from being secret. And he just outright announced, we are in full negotiation. Everybody knew it was one of those open secrets. Right. Um, and it, and the, the idea was to get us out. And the deal that was struck was that uh, the Taliban would immediately stop all military activities against the government. And, stop, and, they, and they promised they would never allow a terrorist organization to operate from Afghanistan to attack uh, the United States. And as soon as the deal was struck, uh, Trump announced that he, he originally announced that he was going to bring the Taliban to New York City 
on 9-11-2020 to, uh, for the United States to sign the official surrender. We were going to, I thought that was really classy, uh, yeah. to surrender on 9-11 in New York City. Just, yeah, that like, would have been I mean, intense. <laughs> just wow. Yeah. Um, and of course, people freaked out, including members of his own party. And he canceled this, the formal surrender uh, ceremony. I, I would have hoped they would have done fireworks or something just to really bring it home. Maybe over maybe where not the World Trade Center no. used to be. Yeah, I don't like I don't know like about all of that. Maybe <laughs> take some of them like airplanes. I don't know. Um, what was Trump thinking? Uh, like, I don't care if you hate the United States or love the United he's States. He's like a child that saw a connection. <laughs> no, he just, you know, like the brain is, his brain is so, um, I don't know. The first thing he said that, was like, that his. When you see a connection, you're like, yes, yes. yes. No meaning, no depth, nothing behind it. It's just like, yeah. 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 Oh, well, yeah. it's all transactional. Everything is, that's, that's about as, as far down as he goes. Yeah. It's, and I'm wondering I mean, if like a Taliban official suggested it. How do you feel? <laughs> and you're like, that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, and then the translator, erase all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, go ahead. So we're, we, I was just uh, going to say, we, we're, we, um, we officially have nine more minutes. We're trying to keep this to 30 minutes from now on. So I'm just wondering, what do you see now? So what, what is definitely happening right now is after 20 years, for, for the record, um, we have replaced the, the Afghan government's military and police force six times. What I mean by that is we have created 600% of the Afghan army and the Afghan police force because it, ha it runs about a 30% per year um, defection rate. So we'll train a soldier, equip a soldier, put them in a uniform, and they'll hang out for about two years. And then in the third year, they take off, they go AWOL. And uh, some of those guys have just gone and joined the Taliban. So in effect, what we've been doing is we've been arming and equipping uh, the Taliban and training the Taliban. Uh, some of those guys go and join warlords. Some of them just go back to their farm and they're taking US money to grow opium. Um, and, and so one of the things that has become extraordinarily clear is that no matter how much money and time we've been spending in Afghanistan, it, we cannot create a stable military slash police force for the Afghans. Um, there's no progress on this. Like the Afghan military just hemorrhages about a third of its population every year. It doesn't uh, have legitimacy. It has no legitimacy. And the Afghan people are, are, are unconquerable. Like only a complete fucking moron would attack Afghanistan. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna, so we are working with a group of Lebanese anti-racism sort of organizers in Lebanon right now. Wow. And um, they thought at some point, I mean, we're, we're still in conversation about this, but um, they are so conscious about whether or not we get money from any entity in the United States that has anything to do with the State Department, like yeah. the level of sensitivity um, wow. that folks in the Middle East have towards the negative feelings they have towards anything that has to do with the United States government. Yeah. Because it is suspect and people who work with it are suspect. It all comes with strings. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, but uh, deep, so and we keep if we don't like your dictator, we'll put another one in. Yeah. So if the United States walks into a an operate, you know, walks into an operation or starts running an operation, does anything in the Middle East with force, it's suspect. Leaves yeah. a legacy of suspicion. It will not work with the people. Okay. So go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Afghanistan has also truly suffered on, a, on another level, which is refugee crisis. So over the course of the last 40 years, so since the Soviet invasion all the way to the end now of our, our war and including the civil war in the fucking middle of this, um, about 8.3 million Afghans have ended up as refugees. 
Um, during the US occupation of Afghanistan, about five, five and a half million of those refugees have returned to Afghanistan. So one of the interesting things about the US occupation and NATO occupation was that it did bring enough stability and calm and it did get rid of the Taliban, at least briefly, for most of the country so that, so that people felt like they could go home. So now that this thing is wrapping up, one of the things that's almost certain to happen is another refugee crisis. Even though the five and a half million refugees have returned to Afghanistan, that still leaves about 2.6 million 2.8 million refugees outside of the country, mostly in Iran and Pakistan. Um, and then there's actually 4 million refugees inside Afghanistan, they're just internally displaced. So one of the things that's almost certain to happen is, a, is, a, is another massive uh, refugee crisis. Iran and Pakistan, Pakistan can only hold so many refugees uh, for financial reasons, in part because the United States is literally starving Iran um, so what will almost certainly happen is those refugees will start heading to Turkey and trying and cross into the EU again. And Turkey already has like two and a half million refugees itself. So it can, again, only bring in so many of those refugees. So they're, they're going to have to go. Like if there's another five and a half million refugees, which is, I think, a reasonable number to expect, almost all of them are probably going to have to head towards Europe. So, wow. we're, so the crisis that we just saw when we destroyed yeah. Iraq and, and Syria is about to repeat itself uh, again. Wow. And then, so we'll see all the political backlash from that. Also, it's worth pointing out that probably over 200,000 people have died in the 20 years in Afghanistan. Um, the estimates are that just under 50,000 civilians, Afghan civilians, um, the Taliban have lost about 51,000 combatants. So that only adds up to about 100,000. What, um, the United States and NATO, we've lost about 3,500 uh, military personnel, but there's all the contractors, which are just mercenaries, right? That, there are about 4,000 dead contractors. So that's about 7,500. And that's actually a great way to sort of disguise your, your fatality rate. You can just go, oh no, they were contractors. And then somehow that makes it not us. They don't count. Yeah. They don't count. Um, the, the rest of the, the losses at about 66,000 are actually the Afghan army. And, and so one of the interesting things about this war has been, usually when the United States goes to war uh, with the third world country, we, the, the fatalities are almost entirely third world. Like in the case of the Vietnam war, we lost 58,000, they lost 3 million. Um, in the case of the Iraq war, we lost 5,000, they lost two and a half million. Jeez. In the case of this war, uh, NATO and Afghan forces actually took heavier losses than the Taliban did. And so that just shows you the extent to which the fight really was uh, logical, intelligent from the Taliban side. Like it was, it was very focused, it was very sharp, uh, it, it was very brutal. Um, so the Taliban have definitely won the war, not just politically, but also militarily. Usually, like in Iraq, we, we won it militarily, but we lost it politically. And I've got in Vietnam, the same thing. And if you lose a war politically, you, you lost. But right. in the case of Afghanistan, we lost both politically and militarily. And then um, since, since a bunch of troops were withdrawn at night in Afghanistan, uh, was that June? Yeah, I, I what the hell the happened there just in the middle of the night? Like the walk of shame averted. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we just pulled out. We didn't tell our allies. We didn't tell Pakistan. We didn't tell the Afghan government. We just snuck out in the middle of the night. Since then, the Taliban have dramatically increased the amount of territory that they own. Um, they, the Taliban probably owned about 30% of Afghanistan. They probably own more like three quarters now. So just in the last few months, whole sections of Afghanistan have, have fallen. Almost all of it is rural, but there is extraordinarily intense fighting now at the second and third largest cities in Afghanistan, uh, Herat and Kandahar. I guess it's the other way around. I think Kandahar is second largest and Herat's third. And then uh, the other town is Lashkarga, which is like the 10th largest city. And those three cities, uh, Lashkarga, of course, is in, uh, uh, Helmand province and that Helmand province got became famous because the Marine Corps took such a blooding there. Um, the 
if the Taliban can capture one of those three cities, it will be a devastating political loss for the Afghan government because then, then it not only have they lost the countryside, but that means they're now starting to lose cities. And, and that's very the, likely. And it is very likely. Uh, all three cities are surrounded on all sides and the fighting is now in those cities. That, doesn't that just prepare us to go in again? I mean, isn't this just a, a preparation for a whole new never ending war? I mean, that's what we do, right? I mean, that's what we did in Iraq. We withdrew and then we had to go back in. But in the case of Iraq, that was a, a special circumstance. Uh, ISIL was on the verge of conquering and unifying Syria and Iraq. Um, ISIL had captured one third of Syria and about half of Iraq. And the Kurds in Iraq were on the verge of collapse. And so the Obama administration uh, had to make some choices. Um, Iran had basically full, full on went into Iraq and was trying to back up the government, but they just didn't have enough. So Obama initially went in with an air campaign, but then brought in units, ground units again. And we, we effectively reinvaded Iraq. And then without uh, invitation, we also invaded Syria. So we are definitely operating in both Syria and, and Iraq, but really small compared to what we did in, in 2003. It's a really small operation. And, it, and the goal there was primarily to stop ISIL. In the case of Afghanistan, ISIL does have a presence in Afghanistan. But it, but it's not. There's no way ISIL is going to defeat the Taliban. The, the Taliban are going to wipe ISIL out. So, uh, so I don't think we have any real incentive to do it. In in closing, what is your prediction? Uh, I will be surprised if the Afghan government is still there January first. Um, I, I was, I was actually NPR had. Uh, Afghan commander, I, I want to say it was April, an interview with an Afghan commander in April. And, you know, he was saying positive things. Yeah, you know, we can we can do this. This is this is doable. We'll stop the Taliban. But you could also hear in the back in his that he was like, Yeah, I'm 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 actually dead. I'm just still <laughs> alive and my my forces are gonna get wiped out. Um and it was really disheartening to listen uh. to because you could you could just hear like the despair coming through, even though he was trying to talk like he had this under control. Um, I don't, if the Afghan government survives to January 1st, I don't think it'll survive to January 1st, 2023. Like, uh, it's going down. It's, it's going down. It's, it's just and a matter of time. Uh, I, for me, the real tragedy is, you know, like the Taliban are going to crush women again and they're going to, they're going to set up this this nasty uh, regime of destroying everything historical and blowing everything up that is right. uh, pre-Islamic. And by the way, blowing up stuff that's Islamic because they don't want icons and idols. They want to. They want to. They want to sort of have a. They have literal interpretation. They have right. Salafi, very Saudi interpretation. No and worshiping this is the land idols. of Rumi. <sighs> Rumi's good. Oh, tell everybody what Rumi is, real quick. Yeah, Molana Jalaladin Rumi was born in Balkh. Balkh is a Mazar Sharif. It's northern Afghanistan. That's the area that that used to be under Iranian sort of uh, northern lines. Yeah. Um, what's the word for that? Like, uh, yeah, uh, under Shah Massoud's uh, uh, patronage, I guess. Um, at any rate, this is the land of um, poetry and Sufism and gentle sort of um, on the ground, in your house, uh, getting close to God, you know, thing. Yeah. And here we are with, <laughs> it's just so, so terrible that the yeah. Taliban had to take root here of all places. Right. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, you guys, thanks Rumi for- Rumi is the same poet that Madonna made famous. Rumi is Rumi yes. that, that the United Where States- Where she does that whole has... ring and a ring and a ring part of their song. Yeah. I, know, I know, I know. My friend was like, is it scat? And I was like, no, this is a language. 
Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. fucking moron. Anyway, uh, thanks for enlightening me. There's a lot of stuff I didn't know, and I'm glad that you guys were here to answer it. And uh, I hope that everybody comes back next time. We are going to have a special guest. Yes, Jacquita uh, Wilson. Jacquita um, Wilson. Yes, Please political go. operative and super organizer in Georgetown, Texas and beyond. Uh, personal friend, wonderful human. Um, can't wait to have a discussion with her. Um, yeah. we're, go we're Google her. We're around some ideas as to what to talk about. Um, um, and we will just who knows what's going to happen in this week yeah that's <laughs> we're right talking about education because she used to be a teacher and she's a Excellent. big organ organizer around education k-12 through education so we'll see uh we'll see what we'll be talking about it'll be exciting yes. thanks everyone have a great week bye bye, bye.